Ken Winter's PhD is an adolescent fiction researcher who is currently senior scientist at the Oregon Research Institute. Ken founded and directed the Center of Adolescent Substance Abuse Research at the University of Minnesota for 25 years. And during his illustrious career, he has published over 140 peer review articles and numerous book chapters. Without further delay, welcome, Dr. Ken Winters. Thank you much, John. And good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to have this opportunity. As you can see from uh, this first slide, I've got three big topics to cover. Um, an overview of brain development. We'll tackle the interesting and controversial topic about um, the vulnerability of the adolescent brain to addiction. And then a major attention on cannabis with a big focus on THC and then a summary and a chance for us to have some discussion and address some of your questions. I have one personal disclosure for you. Um, I hope actually to avoid a reaction that from you that was voiced by a famous Italian physicist, Enrico Fermi, who said after he attended a seminar, before I came here, I was confused about this subject. Having listened to your lecture, I'm still confused, but on a higher level. I'm hoping you will actually be more informed on a higher level. Before I get into the core topics, some introductory material, I wanted to point you to two books that I, I think are great for parents. David Walsh's book, Why Do They Act That Way? It's an excellent read for both you and your teenager. I also like Anthony Wolf's book, the full title, Get Out of My Life, But First Could You Drive Me and Cheryl to the Mall? I think soon you'll see more about why uh, adolescent brain development might have led to that subtitle and why you sometimes get um, a teenager to say something on one hand and then quickly uh, switch to a, an emotional and a, and a very different topic. If you uh, like YouTube videos, I think this is the best on um, adolescent brain development from Sarah Jane Blakemore. She's from Britain. It's a, a really easy TED talk, about 12 minutes. She does a nice job of walking you through the various uh, interesting aspects, the neurobiological as well as behavioral features of brain development. You'll get some of that today, of course, but um, an excellent TED Talk. It is timely that we talk about substance use in teenagers because it, that's a period um, of development of the lifespan when it's likely a person will use the drugs the heaviest and the most. So with modern times, it, this pattern has held up for, for quite some, some period of time. If you reflect on your own youth, you might see that same pattern. So there's a, an experimentation period, escalation during the teenage years. Often you peak in the young adult years and then right around mid twenties, there's a, there's a drop off. Um, we're going to talk about cannabis a lot tonight, but I just wanted to mention something about recent trends of vaping. Um, it's, it's a bit concerning. It also does involve cannabis to some degree. On the right is a chart that shows great news about how cigarette smoking has declined over the past 10 years among 8, 10th, and 12th graders based on a national sample called Monitoring the Future Data. Some great reductions across all through three age groups. This is having smoked a cigarette at least once in the past month. Over here in the red box, reflect daily use of nicotine with vaping and comparing it to smoking. So um, it's, it's a different uh, frequency. Now we're talking daily re rate, so you're gonna see frequencies much lower. The blue arrows, point you to the numbers for 8th, 10th, and 12th graders of daily smoking cigarettes, very low, which is quite promising. 
ah, but not so promising. The red arrows point us to the daily rates of vaping a nicotine product. And you can see it's much higher now than uh, the daily use of smoking a cigarette. And unfortunately, these trends are on the increase over the recent years, while daily smoking are, is really on the decrease. So we're, we're winning on one front, but losing on another. Um, I call this my rays of hope slide. It's a reminder that, um, well, of course, substance use among teenagers is disconcerting. Many teenagers choose not to use substances, at least during their teen years. Again, based on monitoring the future data, they have tracked over the years the percent of teenagers that say they have not used any substance at all in their lifetime. So they take the 12th graders and their survey results are mapped out. And if they indicate they haven't yet used any substances, they get charted. And this blue line represents the nice upward trend. Almost 31% said that in 2018. You can see that that's actually shown a nice increase over the years. The red line just shows you the seniors that said they hadn't used any substance in the past year. Now they might've used earlier. So you get a little, a little bit more teenagers here in the red, but most impressive are the blue line. Teenagers that say they, they're already 17, 18, maybe even 19 years of age, and they've decided to stay away from substances. Now they got some challenges ahead, don't they, with, with some of them going off to college, which can be a risk context, but it, it does remind us that some teenagers are choosing to, uh, to go drug-free. Okay, my first big content area. I'm gonna give you a brief overview of the brain development science. So I'm not a neuroscientist by training. Now that, that's good news and bad news. The, the bad news is you might have a great question at the end that uh, might be a bit beyond my knowledge base. But the good news is I'm gonna have to give you this portion of the talk in a way that I can understand it. And so I think it'll be understandable to you. There's one polling question tonight and we're gonna start right now. So Joanna's gonna help us with this. So you can use your laptop or your smartphone. And the idea is to choose one of these, just one. And the question is which right or privilege in the United States is closely aligned to the general age at which the brain completes maturation? So we'll, we'll wait a moment choose just one, which one is the closest to brain maturation sort of end point? I see what, what is winning so far. We got one of the choices is clearly uh, the most popular. Okay, I, I think uh, most people have weighed in. We'll wait a couple more seconds. Excellent. It was a bit of a trick question. If you chose any of them, you were correct that none of them really are very close to uh, brain maturation. The, the most popular was gambling in a casino, 66%. And actually, that is the one that's the closest because some states have 21 as a uh, minimum age, some have 19. The other ones um, have 18 or even, even younger age, so they could be further away from brain maturation. But um, the reason I gave you this is because I wanted to set up this slide. It's the no principle number one that I want to emphasize when it comes to what we're learning about brain development. And that is that it continues to mature during the adolescent years and doesn't finish or complete major maturation processes until about age 25. So that's a, a big surprise to the scientist prior to having the luxury of, of doing uh, neuroimaging to look at brain maturation, I think people thought pretty much the, uh, the end of childhood and the beginning of adolescence was the point at which brain maturation had pretty much completed its processes. But no, age 25. Um, now, the size of the brain by weight does pretty much top out right around the beginning of adolescence or end of childhood, right around age 10 to 12. You can make a case that the size of your brain is, 
is roughly at an adult level. You can see males have just a little bit more weight than females, but uh, the trend is pretty um, obvious here, isn't it? Right around 10 to 12. Ah, but things are quite different. If we look at more specific brain development processes, there are several to, to consider, four of them here, volume, metabolism, blood flow, and receptor volume. You can see if you chart their their development, many of them have either finished or nearly finished by uh, beginning or early adolescence. But there's two processes that continue on past adolescence. One of them is called myelination. You can see that that needs uh, well into the mid 20s to finish its completion. Myelination is the uh, thickening of the insulation around your neural connections, around your neurons. It's an important uh, maturation process. And then another significant one called synaptic refinement. And you can see how there's a significant uh, drop during adolescence of, of, of this process. And this process is really reducing the number of synaptic connections. This is shown here. Um, if we compare neuron density with all their synaptic connections, comparing picture at birth, at six years of age, see the nice dense growth, but then at age 14, middle adolescence, uh, there's much less. This isn't bad news. You're not losing uh, brain power. It's an important pruning process that actually helps the brain function more efficiently. So it's a good process because in the end, your, your brain is not cluttered with neural connections that it hasn't been using and it, it leaves room for growth and maturation downstream as you might grow some significant uh, connections as you develop into adulthood. The second big principle is that the brain, while developing during the adolescent years, does not develop evenly across brain regions. So one way to look at the brain with all of its different regions is that there's a set of, of, of structures that are called the limbic system or limbic regions, and they have more to do with the accelerator or the go systems in the brain. And then there's um, regions of the brain that um, are more in the front of the brain. Prefrontal cortex is the major one. And you could ascribe the word stop um, to that region. So you don't have equal maturation of the go and the stop systems. The reason I have this photo here is this is a bungee jump that had a little special extra uh, component to it. So instead of just the regular bungee jump where you're up high and you drop down, you can pay extra, you climb up higher, they give you a bicycle, and then you get to ride the bike off a ramp and to kind of launch yourself out into space, Superman-like. And then right about here is where you drop the bike, that falls into a net and you get to also soar yourself out. Um, a little extra um, action going on with this. The limbic system of teenagers would probably be lighting up a lot if they were engaged um, in this activity. So you have this differential maturation. Um, just a couple slides to show this, and then we'll get into the implications of that. This is time-lapse representation of this maturation process. Remember the synaptic refinement, that brown curve? That's what's going on here. So there's this nice efficiency process going on of pruning of synap synaptic connections. But it's, it's not even across regions of the brain, is it? In fact, the front part right here is kind of the stop system that's last. And the parts that are getting blue very early back here are the green or the go systems. So prefrontal, much later, and that has more to do with judgment. The limbic, maturing much earlier, and that has more to do with emotion and motivation. This was mapped by Casey, and he shows um, a, a nice function of, of um, development that compares the limbic system, I call it, or the go system, or the just do it system, and the prefrontal. So if you look at the, the um, trend of the two lines from mid-adolescence to early adulthood, you can see how the maturation process for the prefrontal or thinking system, judgment system is plodding along at a kind of a nice even 
level of maturation. But what's happening with the limbic system, the, the green or the go system, it's maturing quite quickly in adolescence, much quicker than the judgment region. And it isn't until early adulthood that the maturation of the judgment catches up to the maturation of the goal system. So you've got these competing systems and what is dominating? The green or the accelerator systems. And this can have implications for how we think of teenagers. So this slide represents some thinking of my staff and I, where we thought about um, how this differential brain maturations might inform uh, the way teenagers behave and the preferences and attitudes they have. And then we map that with what some of the developmental psychologists were saying. Here is our list of eight, and they um, are in three categories or clusters, preference for less than optimal and greater tendency. I'm not gonna review all eight of them, but if you looked at the list, you'd see, well, gee, these are traits that are common to all of us. And you're right, we all, um, like novelty. We all um, are, when with peers, that probably gives us a little more intensity and arousal. Many of us at times can't control our, our emotions. But the point is that these things happen with more exaggeration or with more salience during the teen years. And they can get to perhaps an extreme point at times that can lead to problems. So, in fact, we looked at the list and then said, well, are, if some of these occur at an extreme level, can they lead to unhealthy choices, behavior problems? And we, we chose these, these um, uh, seven out of eight. We didn't include physical activity, but the others we, we sort of tagged as, you know, if something got out of hand in terms of seeking high excitement or over seeking novelty or, or taking too many risks, that could lead to unhealthy decisions and behavior problems including drug use. But it isn't all bad news because many of these traits are, are very important during the teen years to help with maturation. And so we looked at the list and thought, well, what among these could be significant influences for healthy personal growth? And we selected these five. Not all of them fit the list, um, but um, interest in physical activity, interest in novelty, interest in being with peers, all those can, can be significant maturation processes can lead to teenagers learning new things, extending their talents, and also getting ready for the important task of being an adult. Because in many ways, adolescence is that very important transition period that young people are learning um, various skills and trying out those skills uh, as they seek um, to cope with upcoming adulthood. Now, I want to just focus on the last of the uh, items on that prior list, which was risk taking. Um, this is quite important to our upcoming talk on, on drug use. Um, risk taking is a, a very interesting construct. It, I think, very adaptive, um, some risk taking is probably um, very helpful for somebody's growth. And perhaps if one is too meek or too shy, that might actually be a, be a negative. One could uh, make a case based on a lot of data that um, it's a trait that is fairly stable in a given person, although it surely can, uh, can vary uh, to lesser or greater degrees based on all kinds of factors. Um, there's some data to suggest that um, it's, uh, a trait that follows uh, the normal bell-shaped curve. That is, most of us have a moderate or average amount of risk-taking, then some are at the very low end and some at the very high end. Now, the, there's always been this belief that, well, teenagers are, are just um, kind of wild risk-takers and they don't have very good self-control. But it turns out that probably isn't the case. It's a little more complicated than that, in that risk-taking um, uh, by teenagers follows pretty much the same as adults when they're given proper information. Um, and so they, they, they uh, for example, will ascribe harm um, in a similar way that adults do when given certain situations. But what happens with teenagers that tends to 
be different than adults is that they can be overly persuaded or influenced by emotional and contextual factors. Not that they're misperceiving the nature of risk, but they're just getting pulled in or influenced, heavily influenced by context. And one of them would be peers. Uh, drug use can also alter somebody's contextual influence. And so it's, a, it's an important feature when we think about um, how we um, talk to young people about um, engaging in healthy behaviors, how to reduce risk, how to negotiate the challenges of adolescence. One example that was studied in the lab is a driving example. Now this is a study that used driving simulation data. So there were two sets of outcomes, risky decisions and number of crashes. These are not real. These were risky decisions in a, in a controlled laboratory with a simulated driving situation and number of crashes were simulated crashes. But they had a chance to compare how adolescents, young adults and adults would perform. And then they had two conditions. One is in the blue where they engaged in the task while by themselves. And then they returned and they brought a friend and they had the friend sit with him or her in the front seat of the simulated car, and then they engaged in the task again. So if you look at the two sets of outcomes, risky decisions and number of crashes, you'll see that the blue bars are relatively equivalent across the three age groups. The adolescents actually don't do poorly with driving skill when they're just by themselves without distractions. Ah, but you throw in the peers, um, and that condition, and then you see a big difference and the, the adolescents separate themselves from the young adults and adults. They get worse. That is more risky decisions behind the wheel and greater number of simulated crashes. The other two age groups were able to handle the peer influence. Perhaps brain maturations at play with that. We'll return to some of those principles after as we talk about um, now the second big topic, addiction and the vulnerability of the teen brain. I'm gonna tackle this by um, discussing it with four different principles of how humans and particularly teenagers can be vulnerable to the effects of, of drugs that may lead to addiction. Okay, point number one is um, that all of us to some degree are at risk for a substance use problem. And that's because we have neural wiring and neural chemicals that are sensitive to drugs. Um, that neural wiring is concentrated in a region of the brain that's called the uh, reward pathway region. The artist has tried to show us, it's roughly midbrain with some prefrontal cortex connections and a, an important chemical related to this these neurons in this uh, region of the brain is dopamine, a, a neurotransmitter that's very sensitive to the environment, to stimuli and, and rewards. And the artist has given us an example, when you eat food that's very pleasurable, like chocolate or something you really like, you get a, a small release of dopamine and that gives you a psychological feeling of pleasure and reward. And in a lab that's been studied with animals, so these animal models show how there's a slight bump up in dopamine when the animal is given food and sex also increases dopamine. So does drinking water when you're thirsty. So dopamine reacts to normal and survival-based skills and, and phenomena. Unfortunately, um, drugs of abuse greatly in an exaggerated way, increase dopamine levels. So the artist has added this to the slide. And you can see now if um, representation of taking cocaine, you get this um, very extreme overreaction of the dopamine system and it floods your neural centers with um, excessive amount of dopamine. So you get more than just a little pleasure, you get this big wow effect. In the laboratory that's been shown with uh, various drugs, here are four methamphetamine, cocaine, nicotine, and, and ethanol or alcohol. Um, animal model data, so you can see the spiking is pretty dramatic for all. Now you'll notice on the left on the y-axis, these numbers um, from 100 to 250. For methamphetamine, you had to bring the axis up to 1500. Remember the 
the food and sex, they were creating increases way down here in below 100. So you can just see um, on this level, um, you know, how dramatic the difference is between, uh, ooh, that was good chocolate versus, wow, that drug really had a huge impact. A little bit more about the reward pathway region because it tells us to some degree of the insidiousness of, of, of uh, psychoactive drugs, of illicit drugs. So really there are four regions, important regions of the brain that are involved in reward pathway region. Two of them have to do with emotion and memory. That would be the amygdala and the um, uh, uh, hippocampus. A second important region, the nucleus accumbens, deals and is important for motivation. And then a fourth region, the frontal cortex, is important for decision-making. So look at these four functions, decision-making, motivation, emotion, and memory. So you take a drug, whoops, and it um, leads to um, an emotional positive reaction. It triggers memory. So you remember what you did, where you got it, um, how you might go back and get it again. It uh, triggers and activates motivation. So that means, well, okay, my system might be motivated to return to a good pleasure. And with memory, I can succeed in seeking the drug again. And your decision-making weighs in and says, yeah, we can be motivated to do that. We know how to get it because we remember it and it feels good when we do it. Um, all these things are at play when we you know, are hungry and we have food. When, when we want to procreate, when, when we're thirsty, you want to have water. But unfortunately, they also are at play when we take drugs. So if it was just that we triggered all these systems in the brain that triggered these psychological phenomenon and, and led to you know, motivation to seek pleasure, if that was the only thing, we wouldn't have addiction, perhaps, or at least we wouldn't have it at the level we have it when people overuse. It would just be people having a lot of wow effects. But the problem is the brain goes through changes. When you um, overindulge and you overexcite your dopamine system, and that change in the brain creates a funk and a feeling, an acute withdrawal effect that leads the person to be motivated to go get the drug again, because you've, you've actually dampened your pleasure systems. So you're below par in pleasure, and you wanna then go back to the drug to get back to par. This is the neurobiological data um, that supports what I just said. So on the left here, you have in red, inside the yellow, shows you the um, excessive dopamine levels that have occurred in a person who has um, uh, been using, uh, is, has a, sorry, is normal, has not used drugs. And so the, the, the more red, the better. It means they just have a nice, healthy level of dopamine. But in the box are brain scans of people that have abused these various drugs. And what do you notice? Very little orange inside. Their dopamine levels have dropped because their system had to compensate for the fact that it got overexcited. So it, the furnace was seeing that the house was too hot and it had to turn down the thermostat bring it way down because the, the house is overheating. And so you get a dampened or, or a decrement in dopamine. And what is that going to lead? It leads to a funk. And so people return to drugs because they not only like the, the memory of the wow effect, but they are below par and they, they want the drug to at least get them back to something more normal. Um, risk number two. Um, this is the 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 phenomenon that both genetics and psychosocial risk factors are at play when, uh, uh, when somebody is considering how vulnerable they are to substance abuse or addiction. Um, genes have a moderate causal role. Um, scientists have estimated that it probably accounts for about 40 to 60% of a person's vulnerability to addiction. So that's an important number just because it means that people um, are not biologically um, uh, dictated to have an addiction. Um, the search for the underlying genetics of addiction has led to 
Uh, one principle, there's no single gene, and it's probably hundreds of genes that are, are influencing somebody's uh, biological risk. One general way somebody can um, uh, evaluate their, their, their approximate risk is, is through family history. And then there are several psychosocial risk factors. I have listed here 10 common ones um, and categorize them for under community, family, and then uh, teenager, adolescent. Um, and all of these have a role, but the principle that has been found is that it's no single grouping or, or individual risk factor is um, powerful enough to, uh, to elevate somebody's vulnerability, but it, it's what's called a snowball effect. As the number of risk factors accumulate in a person, then that individual's overall risk of a drug problem increases. Um, you can see in the list that some of them would be well within the range of, of, a, of a parent or a community to try to influence. Some of them would be a little tougher to influence. And some of them in the list of for the teenagers might be influenced by parenting practices and, and other um, uh, environmental factors or community factors, but some of them might be very tough to change. And so there's a lot of research that goes into, so what to what extent can we alter the trajectory of these risk factors that can lead to a real significant change in somebody's personal risk. My third point about risk is normal brain development may also add to vulnerability of a teenager to, to be curious to use and to maybe continue to use. So let's go back to that risk um, identified uh, factors in my list of eight, and I have seven of them that I identified as perhaps leading to uh, the potential of having unhealthy um, uh, behaviors and risk behaviors. If you look at all of these, they also could be a risk for curiosity, curiosity to use and um, the inability to want to stop, or at least the lack of motivation to want to stop using and perhaps continue to use into a problem uh, level. Um, drugs can be rewarding. Uh, peer influences can be important in, unfortunately, in drug choices. Drug use is, is fairly novel. Um, many teenagers say they use because they're having trouble controlling their emotions. Teenagers don't often consider negative consequences. Um, many teenagers, because they're influenced by peers, social information might also uh, be a pull towards drug use. And then the teen years can be a period where taking risk um, is, a, is accentuated and that surely could translate to, to curiosity to use. So in some ways, being a normal teenager is, is, is a risk. And then my fourth is, is related to adolescence, but it has to do with, with brain development. Um, it's, there's a concern that during adolescent brain maturation, dopamine is in a robust period. That means that um, it's producing a lot of dopamine and it's very sensitive to all kinds of environmental factors, including uh, use of drugs. So the theory is that you get a bigger spike in dopamine production when you use drugs in the teen years compared to if you were using it for the first time as an adult. So if you have a more sensitive dopamine system, you might have greater sensitivity to the initial drug effect, so it's more rewarding. This could lead to more and greater motivation to continue to use. And it might mean you just have greater difficulty of wanting to reduce use. So we're all at risk because we all have dopamine. But the one concern is that the adolescent dopamine system is an extra risk. As I reminded you earlier, um, adolescence is a period uh, of drug use and perhaps even the peak years of drug use for most, most uh, Western young people. And the earlier you, do, you start, the greater the risk of addiction. We'll return to this later, but I just wanted to highlight for you that um, the, the longer a teenager can wait to, to use drugs, the greater the likelihood they will not have an adult problem with substance use. So teenagers that can wait till age 19, 20, 21, look how low the bars are. This is down to 10, less than 10% of later having a dependence problem. That's the dependent measure. Uh, but boy, if you start early in life, whether alcohol or marijuana, particularly alcohol, 
you elevate your risk of downstream problems significantly. Interesting study in America called the Adolescent Brain Cognitive Development Study, ABCD. It's a national longitudinal study. It's going to provide a lot of answers for uh, some of the things I've talked about that uh, we're not sure yet uh, with solid data. Um, a very interesting study of over 13,000 children that are going to be followed um, from pre-adolescence into later adolescence and, and with continued funding, maybe into young adulthood. Um, you're probably going to hear more about about this uh, in the years to come. The data are just starting to trickle in because the, the, uh, the longitudinal sample um, is relatively new, but um, as this sample ages into the mid and late teens, of course, then we'll get um, plan, unfortunately, certain percent will, will have used drugs and then there'll be an opportunity to look more at how much genetics, psychosocial risk factors and, and brain development uh, may, might have a role. Okay, the third big topic, a focus on cannabis, which is really a focus on THC with a little sidebar of, of other components of the plant. Um, here are six statements about cannabis. And these are ones that I, uh, I like to get into debates with, with young people and perhaps the, the pro marijuana folks. And turns out many of them are policymakers in our state here. Um, some of them are true, some of them are false. We will go over those later, but I'm hoping to tackle uh, in the next few minutes things about the addictive potential, uh, how well it impairs people's skills, such as driving, um, and whether it can harm brain development or not. As you may know, America is getting more cannabis friendly. Um, so 42 states in the District of Columbia um, in some form legalized cannabis. Now among those 42, 15 of them um, allow commercial sales. Among the medical only states, some of, seven of those have just said CBD only, the non-intoxicant um, part of the plant, CBD, um, doesn't get you high like the THC does in the plant. Um, and then some states have examined decriminalization. But um, just a few years back, it wasn't 15, it was six for the longest time. And you may know last November, several states um, uh, pushed, pushed forward. Uh, the brakes are being applied in some areas of the country. Uh, in red, I have the nine states that in the past three years, at least I've identified that they've applied the brakes to full legalization efforts. Your state, Connecticut, is one of them in my list, and there's many of the others. Um, we'll see how this plays out. Among all these nine, I know there's a big push um, to um, take off the brakes and to unfortunately uh, apply the, uh, the accelerator. We'll see how that plays out. Lifetime cannabis use by grade is charted here. Um, so it, this is the monitoring the future data, grades 12, 10, and eight. And then the green line represents the aggregate. So the red line, which is 12th graders, you can see the trends show that 12th graders are using cannabis at relatively stable levels over the last decade or so. But the upticks are occurring in the younger grades. Grade 10 uptick and down here, grade A uptick in the last of roughly five years. So it's, it's disconcerting. We're, we are seeing a trend upwards and teenagers are also saying that they perceive less harm if one were to use. And when, when teenagers say a drug has less harm, usually the use levels go up. So the trend is not favorable. Big debate on the extent to which um, if you recreationalize marijuana or commercialize it, um, do you have worse youth data? Well, this study looked at not just the level of use, it looked at the percent of users that met criteria for cannabis use disorder. That is a diagnostic level of dependence. We'll call it cannabis use dependence for the sake of this discussion. They compared states that had gone recreational. Well, that means they commercialize it, but they call them recreational marijuana legalization states, the RMLs. And then they used data years before they had gone RML and then looked at how things had changed. So um, this is not monitoring the future data. It comes from another data set, and they always report their data in these age groups, 12 to 17, 18 to 25, and 26 and up. And I've shown you the pre-R 
RML in the light green and then the post RML in the dark green. No change of the rates of cannabis use disorder among those that said they used cannabis in the past year in these two older age groups, but the rate went up in the youngest group. And that was a statistical significant increase, basically 23% to 27%. So just remember these aggregate numbers represent among past year users. So they're quite high compared to what would be lifetime use, but um, disconcerting. States that moved to commercializing marijuana showed later, eventually is one way of saying it, an increase in the percent that met criteria for a problem with cannabis. Um, cannabis uh, affects many regions of the brain. We have cannabinoid receptors, neurons that lock onto THC in various regions. You can see that because of the the uh, omnipresent um, impact of THC, it can affect a lot of things, all the way from brain development to, to, to movement coordination. Let's focus on, on four different ways uh, cannabis THC really has been looked at in the literature. I'm going to focus on brain functioning, addiction, mental health, and then a few uh, other life functioning areas. This is an interesting synthesis study that looked at the percent of performance decrements in a number of cognitive tests, basically thinking skills, things like tracking, reaction time performance, eye-hand coordination, distractibility. Do a couple of those look like they're important for driving? Yes. Now, so it's composite data, and but it shows an interesting trends for both, whether you had eaten a brownie or a THC or whether you had smoked it. And the trend line is very dose dependent. The greater the THC concentration, the more decrements subjects showed. So the, this percent is, is the percent of deficits or decrements in, in various tasks, aggregate tasks of cognitive functioning. But you can see more potent THC, more decrements. At some point, there's a leveling off. Um, but you but you can tell from from this chart the the low end THC of three four percent that was common in the 70s versus the more common 10 to 15 percent nowadays. What a difference in performance decrements across um, a general range of cognitive tasks. Another way this was looked at was uh, changes in IQ. This is a very busy slide. I'm gonna go right to the key point. Um, when individuals that were followed as they grew up and IQ was measured at two time points, one at age 13 and another at age 38, there was a group that had a significant IQ drop and that was the group that were chronic users of cannabis. That's, they are in the chronic group by virtue of three times during adulthood at three different time points, really. They were diagnosed as having a cannabis use disorder and they used before age 18. So there's two big features that led to an average of an, uh, eight IQ points from age 13 to 38. They started cannabis use before age 18, and they use chronically um, in their adulthood. The other groups that either waited till after 18 or they were not as chronic in their use had either no drop in IQ, and that's the blue here, or they had just a minimal drop that wasn't even statistically significant. But eight IQ points, now this is uh, about half a standard deviation. I don't know if you know the, the statistics around IQ scores, but um, it would be, let's say somebody who in theory would have had an IQ of 120 if they didn't smoke marijuana before age 18, but smoked before age 18 and were chronic users, well, they would have an IQ at 38 of 112, losing eight points. Pretty significant, especially if you're around average. So I'll, I'll even go the more cynical. Let's just say you are an average IQ, which is fine. You can function quite well if you have 100 or 105, but if you chronic smoker started early in life, 
your IQ might be down to 92. Now that might mean that there could be a significant loss of, of opportunity in your life. And just a reminder, uh, marijuana is addictive. Now this shows the dopamine changes on, on marijuana. It's, it's of course at the smaller end of the spectrum compared to something like amphetamines. We're down here in the, from 100 to 150 where amphetamines can spike tenfold from 100 to 1,000. So it's in, in at one level, when you look at just the um, neuro, neurochemical definition of addiction, it's not as, um, as severe as uh, some of the other drugs, particularly the speed related drugs, but it does af affect the reward pathway region and affect our dopamine. Um, so how many people develop a, a, a marijuana problem? What's the cannabis addiction rate? Um, it's going to vary depending on you know how young and uh, you started, the uh, level of THC you use, your chronicity of use, but current estimates uh, put it between nine and thirty percent. So at the nine percent, that those are folks that probably aren't using as much. Thirty percent are those that are using heavier. And I've boxed for you um, how age does have an impact on your risk or where you'd fall within that ninety to thirty percent range. So. It, um, if you are a teen onset user, um, the, the risk for you is uh, likely four to seven times, as opposed to if you waited till after your teenage years to use. I'm just showing you this slide again, a reminder um, that the, the pattern is very similar for alcohol and marijuana, not as dramatic for um, as alcohol, but you get the same pattern. Earlier you use, the more likely you're gonna develop a problem, the later you can wait much lower the risk. My third point is the, uh, the issue of, of cannabis and mental health. Excellent review by, by um, Christine Miller, uh, who wrote a chapter in a book. And she did um, a review of, of the existing literature. I summarized it here. It's a little confusing. Um, you might not know the difference between cross-sectional data and longitudinal data, but let's just, for the sake of our discussion, Cross-sectional data means the research design is not the strongest. Longitudinal data, because you're following the same people over time, the research design is stronger. But she looked at various disorders and, and felt like that she could make conclusions about the role of, possible role of, of using cannabis and mental illness with these five disorders. And then I put yellow pluses in the boxes based on the strength of her conclusion. So if there was a double plus, that meant that Christine Miller said that there was strong evidence that marijuana use from cross-sectional data was causal or, or high contributor to schizophrenia. And double plus here means she said where the longitudinal data existed, it also had significant impact. That is a connection between cannabis use and schizophrenia. So you can see that there's a lot more data uh, supporting connections of cannabis and mental disorders in the cross-sectional side of things and a little less data on longitudinal. Where well, there's no plus in a, uh, in a box that meant that she said there was mixed data. Then what did I mean by putting the yellow boxes around these three, schizophrenia, bipolar, and risk of suicide? That's where Christine Miller said that the evidence is even stronger if the individual started to use cannabis before age 18 or during adolescence. So even stronger link of schizophrenia, bipolar, and risk of suicide um, and marijuana use if the person starts use during the teen years. Pretty good summary of the literature by Kroon. I'm gonna read you his sound bites. Although causality is unclear, heavy and dependent cannabis use is consistently associated with high prevalence of psychiatric disorders. Initiation of use during adolescence significantly elevates the risk of suffering from a psychiatric disorder. But rays of hope, Kroon notes there are some studies that if you halt use, it may mitigate the risk or if you surely drop the severity of the uh, psychiatric disorder. Um, it's not clear to what extent or how THC causes mental illness, but I have three things that come to mind as I read the studies and um, have talked to experts. It may create a tipping point. For some young people, by using early in life, you may be at risk 
by biologically for a mental disorder. And by using, you've actually elevated your risk past a tipping point where you will get symptoms of that disorder. In the absence of using, you might not have had those symptoms. Another way is a person might be at such biological risk, they are gonna develop the disorder whether they used or not, but their use of marijuana worsens their course of the disorder, increases the length of the episodes, makes it tougher to respond to treatment, um, and has more episodes. The other problem can be, I think, it, it can alter the, a person's motivation to seek legitimate treatment because they think marijuana is, is, um, is their psychological benefit. I'm gonna skip this slide because it just repeats pretty much what I've just said. I wanted to show you this website for parents. I think it's an excellent source, Marijuana Drug Facts. It's from the National Institute on Drug Abuse. If you don't remember the, <laughs> the link, it's kind of hard to remember all those letters, just Google NIDA, N-I-D-A, parents, marijuana, and you'll, you'll get pointed to this website and a lot of great resources there. So um, here were my six questions. Maybe I gave you some insights on how I feel about it. I'm just going to flip the answers I think fit, but they're in some ways all debatable. I think it's false to say that cannabis is not addictive. I think it is addictive. Of course, it depends. Uh, does it impair driving? I think it does. I, we don't have time to go through all the impaired driving data, but it's pretty, unfortunately, um, compelling that we're getting um, a lot worse uh, drivers on the highways and byways with because of marijuana use. Um, it's not legal for teenagers. Um, if Now, in a medical marijuana state, you might be able to get it under a, a, a state's medical marijuana plan, but um, all states that have legalized for commercial use and sale is, have put the line in the sand at 21. I actually think it's both true and false about marijuana or cannabis being medicine. Complicated topic, but parts of the plant might be. Um, I think it can harm brain development. There's um, you know, initial evidence. Uh, we're going to learn more after the ABCD study is done, um, but it's... Um, uh, the animal models and some of the early um, data suggest that it, it can alter brain development, unfortunately. Remember, that dopamine system is so sensitive, and by overexciting it uh, with cannabinoids is, is worrisome. Synthetic weed is safe. No, that's false. There could be a myth among kids that think, well, I'll just use the synthetic stuff because it's not harmful. Not so. Um, hopefully, you appreciated from my talk that I made the case that adolescence is an extended period of transition from reliance on adults to independence. Um, normal adolescence is characterized by many behaviors that frustrate parents and school teachers. Um, but these are all normal. If you see your teenager in, in this list of seven things, desire to be with friends, irritable, risk-taking, um, love rewards, perhaps forget about consequences, all those are, are very normal. Um, the key is not to have them uh, be exaggerated and not to have these characteristics uh, you know, lead to bad decisions. Um, and I, I made a case that the brain science is telling us that um, brain maturation is significant during the teen years. And, it, and it, it does contribute perhaps to our understanding of adolescence because of the way the brain matures in a differential way. So my final thought um, for parents, stay the course with being an active parent and stay involved with your teen during these years, even though you might get a lot of pushback, uh, you'll be amazed how many teenagers, when uh, they leave the adolescence and chat with you when they're young adults or adults, they, they do express their appreciation. Okay, thank you for this opportunity. I would love to spend some time if you have uh, some questions and we can get into some discussions. Thank you, Ken. Excellent presentation. And yes, we do have questions already. In fact, a lot of information in the presentation. And I want to start. And again, I just wanted to remind people to put your questions in the Q&A, uh, hitting the Q&A button on the bottom of your Zoom for any questions. And we have several. Two of them are very similar. It's, first question is, how permanent is the cognitive impairment for an adolescent brain for cannabis users? And if a person stops using, I'm combining two questions into one, um, can the brain repair itself? Excellent. 
I'm glad you're asking those questions because um, I'm reading more that uh, the data and experts are are optimistic that we're not talking about um, uh, fatal damage uh, with early uh, use of, of cannabis. Perhaps even some of the other psychoactive substances will fall in that category as they get studied. But um, it's, it's important to take that principle to heart because I don't think you're going to get improved cognitive functioning if you continue to use. You're probably just going to be going down a, a negative slippery slope. Um, and so the early, I, I would call it early data because it's, it's um, difficult to answer that question without some of the longitudinal studies that are being conducted, but we don't have the final data yet. But the early data are very uh, positive that there, there can be restoration um, uh, of cognitive functioning and not permanent damage. Thank you, Ken. Next question. There appears to be a controversy about the addictive qualities of cannabis. Some say it's not physically addictive, but only psychologically addictive. What are your thoughts on this issue? Yep, excellent question. Again, um, drugs vary to the extent to which their addiction properties are weighted more towards physical or psychological or both. So we could have this debate about virtually all the psychoactive substances that supposedly are addictive. Now, cannabis seems to get a bad rap that it can't be physically addictive, so it must not be an addiction because people just psychologically like it. I think that's false. The data says that that line of thinking is also false. So people do have withdrawal symptoms and do show tolerance with um, excessive cannabis use, just as they do with other drugs. But some people might not get much of those physical and get more of the psychological. Some might get more of the physical and not so much the psychological, but that occurs with all drugs. So it's a bit unfair to put uh, the addiction microscope under marijuana in that light when that principle holds for all of them. Um, uh, but uh, maybe you don't know that the, the experts with the latest diagnostic manual have allowed that you could meet criteria for cannabis use disorder and have none of the two physical symptoms. I don't know if people knew that, but that's also the case for all the other substances because the experts realize there's a lot of variability in how people react to drugs when they use them habitually and whether it's biology or other factors, the extent to which you have a physical or non-physical symptom is, is not critical to whether you show signs or symptoms of, of a use disorder. So there are 10 diagnostic um, criteria for cannabis use disorder, the same criteria is used for the others. And eight of them are psychological behavioral based, two of them are physical. But you only need six out of 10 to get severe end of a cannabis use disorder. So all of your six could be the psychological bent. But I'll tell you, somebody who's, let's see, using when they shouldn't, feels like they're thinking all the time about needing to use. Their, their excessive use leads to a lot of social or legal problems. Uh, they decide to drop a lot of their um, interests because they want to use instead. Um, it, there's no physical symptom in what I just said, but boy, all those four, for example, are pretty, pretty big signs to me that a person has a problem. Thank you, Ken. What is the right age to start to talk to your kids about cannabis and THC use? Well, I mean, I think um, it's, there's no problem in talking about all the drugs uh, in, in grade school. Um, both schools do, I know, and, and it's great for parents to, to supplement that. Um, it, and don't, you know, rule out talking about nicotine and alcohol, because, you know, the data says those are even more popular than marijuana use among teenagers. Um, I know we're Marijuana is a big topic these days because we're moving to, to relax um, rules about it and allow more access. Where well, we're not doing that with <laughs> nicotine or alcohol, are we? In fact, we're going the other direction. Is, is your state done 21 minimum age for nicotine? Some regions in our state of Minnesota here have gone that route. So, you know, that's why it's topical now, of course, but, but don't rule out the other drugs. And um, by the way, mix it in with healthy behaviors, exercise, diet, 
being being sociable, not overindulging in video games, type of thing. The question always comes up, is THC and marijuana a gateway drug? Your thoughts? Um, I'm uh, more than happy to agree to both a yes and no when experts talk about it, because I think both sides have a yes. I'm sorry, have a have a case to be made, um, a case that yes, it is a gateway and a case to be made that it's not. So I look at the data and say, well, it's surely not a gateway for some people because plenty of people stop their, I'll call it their illicit drug progression at marijuana and don't progress to heroin or something else. Um, but it is true that typically somebody that's um, a heavy user of I'll call it the even harder drugs, probably had marijuana use in their history. But I, I, I pose this question, what if there was no marijuana? Let's just say no one had figured it out. No one found it, plant didn't exist, it's out of the mix. So would that mean people wouldn't use heroin because we didn't have marijuana to gate them to that? Well, no, I mean, people would still, I think, use some of the harder drugs and didn't need, we don't need marijuana to gateway somebody you know, to these harder drugs. Thank you. Here's two similar questions from a legislative perspective. How do you advocate to our legislators not to legalize THC? And do you have hope that the science will ultimately reverse the tide of legalization of marijuana? Well, I'm worried that we're losing the battle because of, for three reasons. There's, um, this is things I've learned in our state of Minnesota here when I've worked with policymakers. There's three problems. One is um, the belief that if you legalize, you solve a social injustice problem. If you legalize, you uh, make it cheaper for your medical marijuana program. And the third is we, we got to legalize it because there's a lot of voters who want it and I'm going to lose out votes. So one is a selfish political reason and the other two are so-called rationales to legalize that are not health related. So I can appreciate politicians who don't wanna lose uh, support of their constituents, um, but they're putting health of their community at risk by I think approving marijuana. And those two arguments that by legalizing we're gonna solve social injustices and help an expensive medical marijuana plan or program, I think are false arguments. You can deal with social injustices or decriminalization if you want to without legalizing. And if your medical marijuana program like it is in Minnesota is too expensive, fix the program in a legitimate way. So, but I'm pessimistic because too many politicians are leaning towards these three, either all three or some of those three and not favoring the health arguments. It is puzzling to me, maybe it has to the person who wrote the question that we've been told to follow the science when it comes to COVID-19, the vaccine, social distancing, et cetera, et cetera. But, but the politicians seem to have a blind eye to the science about the health, negative health impact of THC. Puzzling. Thank you, Ken. And you spoke on a slide regarding uh, marijuana use, THC use, exacerbating mental health issues. Here's a question from the other end. Does having a mental health disorder increase the risk adolescents becoming addicted to cannabis and other drugs. Yes. And that's why some of those cross-sectional studies have a tough time sorting that out. And so you can imagine how this would occur. Youngster starts to have um, difficulty handling emotions, feels, let's say, a lot of social anxiety. And they are, are escalating those symptoms into even a level that might meet, you know, a, a social phobia diagnosis or social anxiety diagnosis. And then the person realizes, wow, if I take marijuana, that calms me down, that relaxes me. So um, they, they do get maybe temporary relief, but the data would say that in the long run, their, their anxiety problem is gonna get worse. It's hard to tell a, a person that because they get the temporary relief and telling them that three or four years downstream, that problem will be worse is, is not a, a big incentive to stop. But yes, the, in that scenario, the mental illness preceded the cannabis use. And that can surely happen with some of the psychoses where you, you get 
early onset psychosis. You may know about this disorder where the symptoms are subtle. They're called preclinical. Um, and the person finds that marijuana helps them with these, these subtle symptoms. But of course, it probably is also exacerbating those symptoms and, and may lead to you know, negative trajectory. Local CBD stores are now selling Delta-8. Can you clarify, is Delta-8 closer to THC than CBD? So uh, it's a, th that one's getting to be a mystery to me. Uh, the little reading I've done suggests two things, that it is a relative of THC or Delta-9. You know, the THC is Delta-9. That's the potent stuff. But it would uh, someone uh, rephrase it as it's watered down or very light, very light THC. One estimate was that it's about 25, only 25% 25 is potent if you had equal nanograms of delta nine and delta eight. So I, you know, maybe one analogy is what's the comparison of, of beer to hard liquor? You know, if you had a had a uh, one ounce of no, 12 ounces of beer and 12 ounces of, of hard liquor. My gosh, you know, one of them is, if you drank all 12 ounces of hard liquor, you'd be, of course, over the top. Um, 12 ounces of beer, while well, you get a little buzz. So there, but I've also read that it might mostly help with people who are, are uh, suffering from nausea uh, or uh, need to gain weight. Now, those can be people who have AIDS or um, wasting disease, you know, some of those disorders. So it's interesting. I know it's getting a little attention because it's under the the uh, radar of the um, of the feds because it's not on the list of Schedule One drugs. It's like a last question related. All of this awareness and increase in CBD use. Is there any science and studies that would suggest that CBD use is harmful to the adolescent developing brain? So far, I haven't seen anything. I think it's mostly a lot of people talk, experts talk about it as, as creating a big placebo effect when people use it for various ailments. It's not clear, except epidiolex, people may know the, what epidiolex is. This is the FDA approved CBD medicine for two rare childhood epilepsies. Um, now that's that's medicine that you get from a doctor. The CBD at the stores, which is low level uh, intensity, um, it may have more placebo effect than anything. I haven't heard anything or seen anywhere that, where it has um, a deleterious effect. I assume people are studying it. Um, it's a good question. Um, I, I just, chemically, it's not an intoxicant. So it doesn't trigger your dopamine. So it's not locking onto the, all those cannabinoid receptors that I showed in that one chart with the little black dots all over the brain. So it's not locking onto those. And so, um, oh, here's, here's one sidebar. I just remembered this. Somebody did a, in Europe, they did a study of THC only, THC plus CBD and CBD only and driving skill. So they did it in Europe and they, they got people intoxicated in, uh, or to use, and they were in these three groups, and then they put them in a car out in a big parking lot, and they had them engage in this, what was called a swerving test, and it, real challenging. And so if you were intoxicated, you didn't do very well. So the groups that did poorly was the one that had THC and THC and CBD, but the CBD didn't help mitigate the THC effect. So it didn't, it didn't uh, cancel THC, but the CBD only folks did just fine. Um, so that would be, you know, actually predicted. CBD is just not, you know, triggering things in the brain like THC does. Thank you, Dr. Winters. Thank you for answering all those questions. And thank you, participants, for asking such great questions. I now turn it over to Paul for us to close our program. Well, thanks, John. And on, on behalf of the support group and everyone attending today, um, you know, I just really want to thank you, Ken. This has been a, a, a true gift for the community. So I, I, we really appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity. 
You guys did a great job organizing this. Thanks to Joanna behind the scene who also <laughs> provided our technical expertise. Yes, thank you, Joanna. All right, thanks again and uh, goodbye, everybody. Thank you.